Um, then we come in uh, to Bernardo Ramazzini, who is considered the father of, of industrial medicine. Um, again, uh, published uh, a, a publication um, that you see here, which again dealt with occupational diseases. And uh, one of the significant things that he uh, was responsible for in the medical industry was or profession was to start asking people uh, what trade are you or in other words where do you work what kind of has try to understand what kind of potential hazards does an individual uh, eventually work with that could be causing adverse uh, health effects to that individual and he was one of the original Physicians that described the illnesses associated with uh, silicosis, which was a uh, illness that resulted from exposure to uh, silica dust. We move forward into the um, 18th century, where we have Percival Pott, uh, basically an England, an English uh, individual, and uh, a, a, in the physician described cancer associated with uh, English chimney sweeps. Uh, if you've ever uh, familiar with a chimney sweep over in England, uh, those are the individuals who go out uh, because they use fireplaces uh, frequently as uh, cooking and uh, as their method to control temperatures within their living spaces. So fireplace was pre predominantly used and they used various uh, fuels uh, to provide uh, the source of, of uh, heat in the fireplace. Well, the, those sources of fuel obviously would create soot, and that soot would be passed uh, out of the uh, fireplace uh, up through a chimney and uh, be discharged on the roof, up around the rooftop of the facility. Well, that soot would build up inside and it would have to be cleaned on a regular basis to keep it from being clogged up. Well, what they would do is they would use uh, orphan boys to uh, clean them because they were small. They could get up into that chimney and uh, clean the, the soot out of that uh, chimney stack. And um, what they found was that <clears throat> those orphan boys started developing a uh, high incidence of scrotal cancer. And uh, so Percival Pott was a physician who made the correlation of uh, the dangers of the soot and uh, the contact with that soot, the causation of, of scrotal, scrotal cancer. As a result of that work, um, eventually uh, England came and passed the Chimney Sweeps Act uh, in uh, 1788. And uh, basically, what this act did. Uh, was not so much protect the uh, chimney sweeps from developing uh, scrotal cancer, but it did provide them with compensation when they did develop it uh, to help pay for uh, their medical needs. Uh, then we move on uh, to an individual by the name of uh, Charles uh, Brackra uh, in, in 1830s, uh, again, uh, an English gentleman who authored the book called Occupational Diseases that was published in England. Uh, his views um, on disease and prevention help stimulate some of the factory and health, safety and health legislation. Uh, he uh, worked on uh, medical inspection and compensation uh, establishment and uh, <clears throat> Uh, again, we have uh, Benjamin McCready, um, who was uh, a New York physician who, uh, and uh, prominent in, in uh, development for talking about various trades and professions in the United States uh, and how those uh, trades or professions or, or types of work could uh, produce disease. He's, Primarily credited with one of the first works on occupational medicine that was published in the United States 
However, most of his work was more geared towards sociological uh, issue than versus uh, the direct medical issue associated with those dangers. One of the uh, real pioneers of industrial hygiene in the United States was a uh, lady uh, called Alice Hamilton. Uh, he had a uh, fairly uh, was a physician and. Uh, quite uh, prominent in the fields of industrial uh, medicine and she published uh, Industrial Poisons in the United States back in 1925. She was responsible for conducting numerous investigations into various industries and being able to recognize potential health hazards associated in, in those industries in the United States. She was a, uh, a medical professor at Harvard University at which time where she uh, published a, a book titled uh, Exploring the Dangerous Trades, which is uh, still in publication. Well, if we look um, at legislative acti activity with uh, respect to um, industrial hygiene related issues, uh, again, we didn't see a whole lot of things happen or come about, um, but it did play an important part in the progress as reg regulations did start to come about and it, it, the legislative activity uh, was a key function of developing an industrial hygiene profession. Some of the earlier ones, uh, legislative uh, activities that we saw was uh, in the British window tax in 1696, which was eventually repealed in 1851. Uh, basically, <clears throat> there was an interest in laws that uh, industries would be taxed for the number of windows that they had in their building. And the more windows you had, then the more tax you would pay. Well, what industry started doing was boarding up the windows. As a result of that, uh, they created hazards within the, the uh, building. So it would become dark and poorly ventilated. Um, then we saw a, another uh, British uh, related piece of legislation titled the British Factory and Workshops Act in 1802. Uh, again, those were that was legislation that started addressing the working conditions in various factories in, uh, in England. <clears throat> the Act of 1864 required sufficient ventilation to ensure that uh, gases and dust did not reach harmful levels. It was actually not until 1867 that inspections were authorized uh, and they would come around and require people to, to implement or, or install fans or mechanical devices to um, control dust within the workplace. The British Factory Act of 1897 required the use of ventilation on, on uh, certain operations. To a <clears throat> little uh, was published on the techniques of how to be able to do that until the 1930s. Uh, looking at legislation in the United States, uh, between 1902 and 1911, um, we saw some legislative acti activity regarding um, safety and health conditions by the federal government and, and uh, one particular state, Washington, Developing a workers' compensation program. Again, this was a program that was designed to not necessarily to prevent unsafe and unhealthy conditions. It was to provide compensation. If you did become injured or ill, you would receive some compensation uh, for that injury or illness. Um, by 1948, all of the states um, had uh, workers' comp that covered uh, occupational diseases or industrial hygiene related illnesses. Uh, with respect to surveys in the United States, um, they were conducted, the first uh, surveys that uh, were, were recorded of being prominent in any way were conducted by the Illinois Occupational uh, Disease Commission uh, in Later in uh, Massachusetts, uh, we saw the appointment of health inspectors to go out and start developing or conducting inspections of occupational work conditions 
and dangers associated with those working groups. In 1910, we had our first national conference on industrial diseases in the United States. In 1912, U.S. levied, levied a prohibitive tax on the use of white phosphorus in the making of matches because of the dangers associated with that white phosphorus. In 1913, we saw the uh, development organization of the National Safety Council, which is still in existence today. Uh, during that same year, we also saw New York and Ohio establish the first state industrial hygiene agencies. In 1914, the U.S. Uh, Public Health Service organized a division of industrial hygiene and sanitation. Uh, also in 1914, the American Public Health Association was organized uh, with a section on industrial hygiene. In 1916, the American Association of Industrial Physicians and Surgeons was formed, and the, medical medical, the American Medical Association uh, held its first symposium on industrial hygiene and medicine. In 1922, Harvard established a degree program so people could go and study uh, industrial hygiene and be able to graduate with a degree uh, with, in that uh, subject material. Um, in 19, between 1928 and 1932, we saw the Bureau of Mines uh, conducting research uh, with respect to the toxicology of solvents and vapors and various gases. And in 1936, one of, the, one of the prominent pioneering regulations was the Walsh-Healy Act, which basically the Walsh-Healy Act uh, stated that anybody, any company that was going to be providing goods or supplies to the government, they must maintain a safe and healthful workplace for their employees. Uh, in 1938, we had the formation of the American Conference of Governmental Industrial Hygienists. <clears throat> that was a, a nonprofit professional organization that was formed by governmental industrial hygienists uh, to be able to exchange information and ideas. And we'll talk a little bit later about that agency uh, or organization, I should say, is uh, still in existence and still fairly active and uh, still contributes significantly to the field of industrial hygiene. In 1939, we saw another professional organization develop, titled itself American Industrial Hygiene Association. Since not all industrial hygienists were governmental industrial hygienists, uh, these other industrial hygienists wanted to have an organization, again, that provide professional uh, support to them, and so they developed uh, the uh, AIHA, as it's called, American Industrial Hygiene Association. The American Standards Association and ACGIH, uh, during 1939, prepared their first list of maximum allowable concentrations of chemical substances, um, and, and this was the beginning of the development of exposure limits that were supposedly a safe exposure limits for workers to be exposed to without it, uh, experiencing adverse health effects. In, uh, between 1941 and 1945, we saw industrial hygiene programs established in, in uh, most states. By 1945, the Bureau of Mines uh, was developed and uh, authorized to inspect mines for safety and health conditions. In 1960, we uh, saw the formation of the American Board of Industrial Hygienists, um, and, or Industrial Hygiene, and that was a, a joint um, organization developed by ACGIH and AIHA, and that is the agency that does the certification. So the American Board of Industrial Hygiene, their primary responsibility is to provide uh, the certification mechanism for those people in the industrial hygiene profession who want to become certified. Then in 1966, uh, uh, we saw a significant mine-related uh, 
regulation come out and it was titled the Metal and Non-Metallic Mine Safety Act. Again, like we saw early in uh, early civilization, mining was a extremely hazardous situation. It still was, and it was recognized in the United States as that. <clears throat> and so the Metal and Non-Metallic Mine Safety Act had dealt with uh, if you were going to do mining, what the um, uh, rules and regulations are for, for, for protecting workers uh, in that work environment. Then in 1969, we saw another mine related piece of legislation come about, which was titled the Coal Mine Health and Safety Act. And interesting enough, um, legislation was working on development of the Occupational Safety and Health Act that would protect all workers in all types of industries. But in the 60s, late 68, 69, there was a coal mine accident that killed a number of workers. And as a result of that accident, the legislative committees put aside the Occupational Safety and Health Act and implemented the Coal Mine Health and Safety Act. Uh, then the following year in 1970, uh, we saw that Occupational Safety and Health Act into being. And that was the first legislation that uh, would affect all industries and work and protect workers in uh, all types of professions uh, from unsafe and unhelpful work conditions. In 1977, we saw another mine related uh, legislative come about in the Federal Mine Safety and Health Act. And then uh, from 1992 to present, we're constantly seeing efforts uh, to address OSHA, the Occupational Safety and Health Act, and trying to update and uh, amend certain provisions of the uh, <clears throat> OSHA law. For those of you who may not be familiar with OSHA, it stands for the Occupational Safety and Health Act or administration, depending on how you are referring, and it was uh, the administration was actually formed in 1971. Um, <clears throat> this will be a test question, um, so you may want to mark this particular slide. Um, it was placed under the Department of Labor, and its primary responsibilities were for uh, promulgating safety and health standards, or modifying standards, and more importantly, to enforce um, the implementation of those occupational safety and, and health standards. A little bit later today, we'll go into a little more detail on those standards. Primarily, the focus of OSHA is uh, to conduct inspections of the workplaces to ensure that employers are providing safe and healthy working conditions. If they are not, they're authorized to issue citations to that employer for violations of the safety and health rules. And they're also uh, authorized to issue penalties associated with those violations of the standards and the severity of those standard uh, penalties would be dependent uh, upon the severity of the violation of the standard. OSHA also conducts education and training programs and these education and training programs are primarily geared towards um, employees uh, of work workforces. Uh, they also provide consultation services uh, and typically a free service that employers can uh, call OSHA and request a, a consultation visit. However, uh, you don't see this particular aspect of uh, the OSHA administration utilized a great deal because employers just don't feel comfortable inviting OSHA into your, into your industry and take a look and see what potential problems you may have in existence. But it is a, a service that is available and provided by OSHA. Um, when OSHA came into being, the laws were passed and what they, uh, they said we want to employers, employers to provide safe and healthy work environments. And we need to make sure that they comply with certain rules and regulations to ensure that that is conducted. Well, <clears throat> Instead of writing brand new rules and regulations, um, 
OSHA developed what is referred to as consensus standards, and they took those consensus standards that had been developed by various groups or agencies and made them into law. And this upset a lot of people when OSHA first came into being because the consensus standards oftentimes were developed by industries that said, hey, if we have the most perfect world and the most perfect workplace, these would be the conditions that we would have. Well, when OSHA took those consensus standards and, uh, and uh, implemented them, they all of a sudden took them from being, this is the ideal situation, and made these the minimum requirements. Um, <clears throat> uh, with respect to the health standards that were adopted, um, what they did is they adopted the 1968 ACGIH threshold limit values. Again, those were guidelines or consensus standards, if you will. Uh, and all of a sudden, they were enacted and, and became uh, a law. <clears throat> Another agency that was formulated when OSHA, when the OSHA Act was passed, was the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health, or NIOSH. Now, NIOSH was developed for specific person to support OSHA. It was placed, however, in the Department of Health and Human Resources. Note how OSHA was placed in the Department of Labor. NIOSH is in a totally different uh, group under the Department of Health and Human Resources, which is located under the uh, CDC. <laughs> and basically, their role, NIOSH's role, was to identify hazards and recommend regulations to eliminate or protect employees from those hazards. In doing so, they conducted a lot of field research investigations, um, and as a result of those investigations, would come up with recommended uh, regulations for OSHA to implement. That was the, that was the in, intended purpose for NIOSH. Again, this is what you'll need to know for the uh, test. But, um, it hasn't quite worked out as smoothly uh, as what was intended because oftentimes NIOSH will fulfill their roles of identifying the hazards and uh, coming up with guidelines or recommend, recommended regulations and they'll send them over to OSHA but OSHA has been um, <clears throat> oftentimes unsuccessful of being able to implement and promulgate those recommended regulations. Uh, another thing that NIOSH does is it provides a training and education programs for people who want to pursue careers in the health and, and safety professions. Uh, so people such as yourselves who are interested in health and safety uh, profession as a career uh, can take a NIOSH course that will help uh, support them and enhance uh, their education capability. And finally, the other thing that NIOSH does is it conducts testing and certification of personal protective equipment, uh, specifically uh, respirators. Some of the other agencies that um, can have an impact or an involvement in uh, safety and health are MSHA, which is the Mine Safety and Health Administration, uh, Department of Transportation, uh, the Food and Drug Administration, uh, when it comes to labeling of, of uh, chemicals, uh, EPA, uh, many of you are well aware of EPA regulations such as Toscan, RICRA, and CERCLA. Uh, you can also have FIFRA, which is the Federal Insecticide, Fungicide, or Denticide uh, Act. And then uh, Besides the federal types of agencies, you can have state programs and state agencies that can have an impact on industrial hygiene related issues. And then finally, you could even get down as long as some local community um, impact on uh, the safety and health profession. Uh, some of the societies, professional societies that we have in existence uh, that are pertinent for industrial hygienists are Number one, the American Industrial Hygiene Association, again a nonprofit group uh, referred to as AIHA. So if you're ever uh, 
see or hear that acronym. That's what it stands for. You have the American Conference of Governmental Industrial Hygienists, uh, again, the acronym of ACGIH. We have the American Board of Industrial Hygiene, ABIH. Their prominent role is to certify professionals um, as certified industrial hygienists. Uh, at one time, when you became a certified industrial hygienist, you had to join the American Academy of Industrial Hygiene, or AIH. And that was a uh, no, again nonprofit organization of certified industrial hygienists. That has since been absorbed into the AIHA, so you no longer have that dual uh, membership. That's all part of one. And then we have the American Society of Safety Engineers for uh, those people who not only have to deal with the health hazards, but they have to deal with safety hazards. And you have the Board of Certified Safety Professionals which again, much like the uh, American Board of Industrial Hygiene, the Board of Certified Safety Professionals, is that certification agency uh, for uh, safety professionals. When we look at an occupational safety and health team, the types of people that will be involved, uh, certainly management um, is the key member. Uh, we've got industrial hygienists. We can have safety professionals. Uh, there are occupational physicians out. For extremely large company, companies, those people may be on staff. For more um, common-sized com companies, uh, they utilize an occup occupational physician clinic and service perform to assist them in uh, their health problems. Uh, you can have occupational health nurses that get involved, and other disciplines such as uh, toxicologists, epidemiologists, engineering personnel of various types, uh, certainly the environmental people, such as yourselves, uh, need to be involved with the safety and health people, and health physicists, and, and I'm sure there's uh, many others. Uh, for people who are pursuing careers in industrial hygiene, there are certain designations that uh, have, have been established. One is a occupational health and safety technologist. Uh, this is somebody who is, uh, maybe doesn't have a degree in industrial hygiene, but has some other related experience and so on. Uh, this is the uh, terminology used to describe that person. Then you have an industrial hygienist, which by definition is somebody who has a degree in industrial hygiene or related field. And uh, we used to have a certified associate industrial hygienist. That has since uh, been eliminated as well. Now, uh, we still have a certified industrial hygienist, CIH. As I mentioned, there's roughly about 6,500 in the world. And then you have people who move up in management and uh, could become industrial hygiene managers. So that gives you a little bit of the history of industrial hygiene and uh, where we were and, and up to where we are uh, today. Uh, the next section we're going to talk about is just a quick review of math, chemistry, anatomy, and physiology. But uh, it'll take about a short five minute break. Uh, and then when we start up again, we'll talk about uh, a review of those sciences.